you're live. Hello, good afternoon, um, and welcome to this virtual meeting of the Health Policy Commission's Advisory Council. I'm David Seltz, the Executive Director of the Health Policy Commission, and uh, just want to say first how grateful I am to all of the Advisory Council members who are participating virtually here today. Uh, we have a full Zoom room, um, and it's, it's really just wonderful to, to see all of your faces uh, and to connect with you again. Our last Advisory Council meeting, if you can believe it, was uh, in May, only four months ago. Uh, it feels like four years ago to me. Um, a lot has, has changed and happened in that four months. And so uh, really looking forward to this opportunity to reconnect with all of you uh, and the work of the HPC as it has been uh, a very busy four months. Um, so for today's meeting, uh, what we'd like to do is really engage all of you in the beginning of a conversation about how our broader healthcare community uh, in Massachusetts can come together to meet some of the unique challenges of both the moment and the future of healthcare reform in Massachusetts. Um, we're approaching the 10 year anniversary of the passage of chapter 224. Um, and this feels like an opportune time to reflect and for all of us to work together to see how we can best advance the goals of that legislation um, as, as that really is, as I view it, the Massachusetts model. How, how can a broad group of stakeholders uh, come together to advance healthcare policy that is data-driven, that is learning from experience, that is evolving uh, and meeting uh, the moment, so to speak. Um, so with that goal in mind, we're going to be discussing our latest cost trends report, uh, which was released two weeks ago and includes a set of um, five policy recommendations. Um, so we'll want to spend some time in this meeting uh, giving you an update on that report and those recommendations and would love to, to begin that conversation about how we can work together to advance some of those concepts. Um, but prior to doing that, I, you know, I do want to acknowledge the context uh, in which we're holding this meeting and, um, and also to aid in our ongoing work on uh, the impact of, of COVID-19. Uh, I do want to open the discussion up for a few minutes to hear from you all on your unique perspectives and on the current challenges facing your organization or the organizations you represent or the workforce you represent. Um, particularly around current capacity challenges and, and staffing challenges, which have been uh, exacerbated by COVID. Uh, obviously, the, the policy, the environment in which we are has changed in the last four months. And so um, we'll, we'll open it up uh, for some of your thoughts, and we welcome your thoughts and reflections uh, kind of on the current, um, your current challenges. Um, but before we get to that, I wanted to, that wasn't on the agenda per se. So I want to give you a little heads up if you want to think about um, what you might want to share there. Um, but before we get to all of that and before we get to the report, uh, we did have a couple of just um, some announcements, some exciting announcements, some updates. Um, and we're also going to just give uh, you all a brief preview of an upcoming evaluation report on one of our grant programs uh, that we'd love to get your thoughts on. So a packed meeting, uh, lots to discuss. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it right over to Colleen to uh, give us some announcements and uh, updates. Great, thanks Director Seltz and welcome advisory council members. Um, just at the top, we have our full slate of membership on this slide, just to remind you all of who's on the council. Um, if you have any questions during this meeting, please just raise your hand or send me a message via chat. I maintain the queue throughout the meeting. I can get as long as um, a dozen or more people, but I will add you to the list and you will absolutely be called on. Um, so on the next slide, I do just have a few agency updates um, for you all to kick us off. Um, this slide is just an overview of new work uh, released over the summer and slated for release this fall, starting at the top, the 2021 cost trends report. This will be the major topic of our discussion today, as Director Selt said. This report, the executive summary, and the data chart pack are all available on the HPC's website now. Um, and I do just want to call your attention to the new feature of the cost trends report this year, which is an interactive 
data dashboard utilizing Tableau. This is something we're really excited to be able to share as it provides a new and really engaging way to dive into the data contained in this year's uh, report. And so that is also on our website. So feel free to go there and click around. Over the summer, we did debut a new video series called HPC Shorts on our YouTube channel. Each video in the HPC Shorts series is just a few minutes long, focuses on key pieces of data from recent research. And the goal here is just to really make complex healthcare issues more digestible for our many uh, various audiences. So the first short uh, was released last month looking at the findings from our uh, preliminary COVID impact study, um, highlighting specifically the different types of ED visits seen between January 2019 and September 2020. It's, it's really, really great. So this and future HPC shorts will be posted to our YouTube channel. So check them out. And then the rest of the slides shows some publications, which may be of interest to you that we have in the pipeline. I'll talk about them more in a minute when I preview our upcoming policy committee meeting agenda. So on the next slide, also want to highlight another publication here. We released this over the summer. This is our health equity style guide. First of all, thank you to those of you, many of you who assisted us in this project by providing valued advice and guidance and line edits. We really, we really appreciate it. So this has been um, released. This is an internal reference tool with guidance on how to incorporate health equity principles and inclusive language into all of the HPC's work streams and outputs. And this work is really part of our ongoing wide ranging commitment to advance health equity through our voice and our roles as a watchdog, researcher, reporter, convener, and partner. Um, within this work, we felt it was important to develop a shared understanding of the context of racism and inequities affecting health and a common vocabulary for communicating about equity that really avoids bias, encourages inclusion, and prompts reflection in all of the HPC's work. So we have identified tangible goals to keep us accountable to our full health equity framework for the agency and evaluate our own progress of integrating health equity into all of our work streams. And just to note, this guide is, is definitely an internal tool, um, post, but it is posted on our website and available for the public to utilize and other state agencies if, if they choose to do so. So encourage you to check it out um, if you haven't already. And of course, welcome any thoughts and input um, from you all on the content of this guide. One note on this too, because I know you will ask about this. We are consistently updating it. We have an internal working group that meets quarterly or sometimes more often as needed. So it's gonna be updated. It's gonna have the most up-to-date inclusive language. Subsequent editions are already, are already coming out. So we will publish those as needed. Um, all right, great. On the next slide, this is just um, our HPC board is meeting next week in their policy committee role. Um, so these agendas, that's next Wednesday, October 6th, starting at 9.30 a.m., we have the Market Oversight and Transparency Committee meeting. This meeting, we're going to be doing a deep dive with our commissioners on the first two policy recommendations in our cost trends report. So one is strengthening accountability for excessive spending through the performance improvement plan process, the PIPs process, and the second is constraining excessive provider prices. Those are the first two recommendations in the cost trends report. So we're gonna do uh, a deeper dive with research and data into those. And then the rest of the moat agenda is gonna be a presentation of initial findings from a report on children with medical complexity in the Commonwealth um, that I mentioned a little bit earlier. So we're planning to release that full report this winter, but we are gonna be doing a preview next week. So if you're interested in that, please do check that out. And then at the Care Delivery Transformation Committee meeting right after that at 11 a.m., we're going to have updates on our uh, Accountable Care Organization, ACO Distinction Program. We are going to release findings from the evaluation report on targeted cost challenge investments, which uh, Kelly Hall will be talking about in just one minute. Um, and then some initial findings from a new chart pack that we're going to also be releasing this fall on certified nurse midwives and maternity care in Massachusetts that is really interesting and compelling. Um, so apologize, my phone is ringing, put that on mute. Um, so that will be coming out this fall. So please make sure to tune into these meetings if you can, again, 9.30 a.m. on that YouTube channel I keep mentioning next week. Okay, last but not least, uh, the cost trends hearing. This is scheduled uh, for Wednesday, November 17th at 12 p.m., our ninth annual healthcare cost trends hearing, less than two months away. For some of our new folks 
who may not be familiar, our healthcare cost trends hearing is an annual opportunity for policymakers, researchers, and all healthcare market participants to convene to address the challenges and discuss the opportunities for improving healthcare and health policy and reducing healthcare costs in the Commonwealth. It's it's a truly a unique can't miss event that we've put on for the past um, eight years, and this will be the ninth, as said. Uh, so this year's hearing is also going to be a virtual event. It's going to be a half day event, and it's going to be stream live on our YouTube channel. We will be engaging with you, our stakeholders, and our advisory council in the coming weeks to put this event together. Last year, we focused uh, totally on COVID-19, uh, both its impact on the system, on the healthcare system, and on health equity. This year, we're continuing with that theme, also diving deep um, in pushing on the intersections of cost containment, affordability, and health equity. So similar themes, but a uh, deeper dive this year. Um, many of you know firsthand because you've you've been called to testify, but we do call market participants and stakeholders to testify either in writing or at the hearing in person. Um, so you, you as an individual or an organization will be notified very soon by us if you have been called to testify, if you haven't been already. Um, and an agenda will also be released in the coming weeks, both on our website and via email. We are asking for advanced registration, even though it's virtual. Um, it, this is available on our website, mass.gov backslash HBC. Even though it's virtual, you will get um, specific event-related communications if you register ahead of time. So please do please do that for us. We appreciate it. Um, so we're looking forward to engaging you with, with us on this. And uh, we'll certainly be reporting back to our advisory council later in this year on how, on how it all goes, for sure. Um, so, of course, happy to take any questions. That's it for me now or at any time. Um, but in the meantime, I will turn the mic right over to my colleague, Kelly Hall, who's our Senior Policy Director for Healthcare Transformation and Innovation, who is going to talk about, talk about our investment program evaluation that we're releasing. Kelly, do you want to take it away? I am happy to, Colleen. Uh, good afternoon, council members. I am really pleased to be here today to briefly review findings from our Total Cost of Care Challenge Investment Program and seek your input on a couple of important questions that arose during our evaluation of that program. I'm joined today by my colleague, Catherine McLean, who led the evaluation of the program and can help any answer any questions you might have. So let me start by grounding you in the key features of the Total Cost of Care Challenge Investments Program, which I am going to mercifully refer to by its acronym TCCI going henceforth. So the TCCI program arose out of the HPC's recognition of a number of areas of perennial high cost and high, and high utilization. In consultation with stakeholders, an investment program was conceived that would allow awardees to select from one of eight cost challenges and deploy innovative evidence-based interventions focused on that challenge with the aim of developing models that would improve care and reduce costs, thus positioning awardees for success in, value, in a value-based payment environment. Ultimately, $6.6 .6 million was awarded to 10 awardees over an 18-month period of performance starting in 2016. Next slide, please. While we don't have time today to offer an in-depth description of all 10 programs, I did want to give you the opportunity to see who the awardees are and their chosen areas of focus. While eight opportunities, uh, eight options were offered, awardees converged on five particular cost challenge areas, health-related social needs, serious illness and end-of-life care, site and scope of care, behavioral health integration, and care transitions in post-acute care. Due to the nature of the cost challenge areas, these programs ended up focusing on patients with significant social vulnerabilities, as well as clinical complexities. They also frequently relied upon non-clinical workforces like navigators and community health workers who were able to forge close relationships with these patients, something that proved to be particularly important for folks who started from a position of mistrust in the system based on racism, feelings of stigma, or just prior bad experience. These awardees also engaged closely with community-based organizations to meet the huge diversity of patient needs. And at the end, I'm, I'm hoping we can return to some of these themes as part of discussion. Next slide, please. 
So here we wanted to highlight a few select pieces of data demonstrating the impact of the TCCI program in a range of areas. Um, I'm going to give a plug now for uh, a visit to our website to see our TCCI impact brief and in the foreseeable future our full evaluation. But just to give you um, a flavor of what we saw. You know, Brookline, uh, Brookline Community Mental Health Center delivered reductions in cost, while Hebrew Senior Life addressed utilization of EMS transports, and Care Dimensions reduced readmissions. Other organizations like Berkshire Medical Center and, whoops, and Brookshire, yeah, like, Brook, uh, excuse me, uh, Berkshire Medical Center addressed what we think of as utilization adjacent uh, areas, like access to, to behavioral health, as did BHN, which decreased the percentage of homeless or unstably housed families they dealt with. Overall, TCCI awardees served over 3,800 patients and worked with more than 60 community organizations to implement their programs. So at the end of the program, five of the 10 awardees were able to continue their models in a manner much as, the, much as they were implemented in TCCI program. Three others were able to retain or continue significant portions of their models, sometimes through creative means. For example, BHN's Project FIT program was essentially integrated into the Holyoke Public Schools to maintain community health, health workers as support for homeless families in their districts. Next slide, please. As always, a key goal of our investment programs is to harvest as much learning as we possibly can to help other organizations consider, considering similar work and to influence uh, policy and practice. Despite the significant heterogeneity in the areas of focus and in the awardees themselves, several themes emerged consistently across the TCCI program. The first is that working across sectors with social service organizations proved to be absolutely critical in addressing patients, patient needs and extending the capabilities of awardees by bringing in expertise in complex systems like housing that they simply didn't have themselves. The second is that many of these programs really centered around care coordination as a way to work across the health systems themselves and ensure that patients received care aligned with their specific needs and goals. The third point is one that I've mentioned already, but it bears repeating, that community health workers, patient navigators, and similar non-clinical roles were essential to many parts of many of the programs, working to engage patients, connect them with services, and really provide holistic person-centered care coordination and support. You know, building on that theme is this notion of trust, of building trust and relationships. You know, the, the relationships that patients formed with the community health workers were significant in significant factors, frankly, in the patient's abilities to engage with the TCCI program. And finally, not to be discounted, are the larger social forces that exist outside the walls of the awardee organizations. Even the most dedicated staff encountered larger systemic barriers like lack of affordable housing or access to substance abuse treatment beds, which made the, made the task of addressing their patients' needs particularly challenging. So at this point, let me pause and open, uh, open the, the mic, I guess, or the, the chat for questions. And also, you know, it, depending on what uh, what folks want to discuss. I also have a couple of questions that I wouldn't mind posing to you. So I'm going to open the chat and see. Okay. Um, I'm noting a, a comment from, from Colin that he directed to me. Colin, are you okay with my sharing this with the group? I think he just had to step out to testify at a legislative hearing, but feel free, Kelly. Are you sure? Okay. All right. Um, so Colin shared the fact that there is substantial concern in the disability community that shifts in CCA's care models have massively undermined the quality of care for their most medically complex members, leading to some very serious negative outcomes. So obviously that, that's a concern and I think something that we will want to um, to 
understand better from, from Colin when he's available. Okay, so there being no other questions, let me be selfish and pose some questions to you. <laughs> Kelly, I don't have a question, but I don't type fast, and I was typing a comment. Okay. Um, sometimes we hear all of this information, and it's way up here, and it sounds amazing, mm -hmm. and it is amazing, and I can make it real for you really quickly. The BHN community health workers that are placed in Holyoke Public Schools the Springfield Food Policy Council, which makes all of my work possible, train those CHWs to talk about the Healthy Incentives Program, uh, a local healthy fresh produce program that's open to all SNAP recipients across the state. They purchase that produce from local farms um, and often nonprofits like Guarding the Community in Springfield, Noesius Reuses, and Holyoke. 300 people learned about HIP and started eating healthy produce on a regular basis because they were part of the BHN CHW's uh, patient population. So imagine that multiplying across the state um, when right now only about 5% of the SNAP recipients use this additional benefit that gives them anywhere from 40 to 80 extra dollars a month and doesn't reduce their SNAP benefit. So if you're, if it's, hard for folks to sometimes place this in real life in addition to all of the health care um, access that those patients are being referred to. If I'm one of them and I find out that I have diabetes and I have to stop eating the food that I have been eating because it's cheap and filling, and then I find out, and here's how we can help you do that by taking your SNAP uh, benefits and going to one of these providers, which are often community-based entities, and buying the produce that your doctors and your nurse practitioners um, and your health advisors are telling you to eat. That's just one little piece. And I just wanted you to hear that in real time from somebody who sees it every single day. Um, let me just say that is that is music to our ears. I mean, I think nothing is more important in these programs than the impact it has on real people in the day to day. So to hear that very specific story of it really is um, incredibly compelling. Um, I noticed there's a uh, question in the chat about uh, with more interest in the BHN model and a question about whether there will, there will be a descriptive issue brief about BHN and other programs with lessons to disseminate. It's a great question. And let me let me just say right now that, that what you have seen today and heard from me is the, the, the top sort of half inch of the knowledge that we have around uh, these programs. So if you would like a little bit of a, a, a just a couple more bites of TCCI. We have an impact brief on our website that describes all of the programs. If you're really interested in deeper learning, um, keep your eyes open for our complete evaluation report, which provides extensive descriptions of the um, individual awardee programs. That should be coming in the next couple of weeks or so. So, so definitely watch the website because there's, there's considerably more information to come. And, and I really want to credit my colleague, Catherine McLean, for, for that the hard work that got us to that. Um, there's another question about the, the behavioral health component. Has there been any partnership among the award, whoops, partnership among the awardees with employers. I've heard consistently from roundtable members that the mental health wellness needs of employees, particularly those working remotely or hybrid is a priority. I'm actually, I'm, I'm glad I just men mentioned Catherine. Catherine's knowledge, deep knowledge of all these awardees is, is pretty much unsurpassed. So, so Catherine, are you aware of any of the awardees working uh, specifically with employers? So I think in the context of the TCCI program, the target populations the awardees selected weren't necessarily limited to a particular employee and were often looking at um, other criteria. I do think some of the models, um, particularly that Berkshire Medical Center implemented of behavioral health integration in primary care, um, could be something that um, employers might want to look to partnering or encouraging on if they're wanting to increase access for their patient, patients or their employees, sorry. Um, 
as patients of these, um, you know, primary care providers or as patients who are part of their, their covered um, health insurance. Um, and I think, you know, the other thing that's a little tricky about releasing this TCCI report now is these programs took place obviously well before um, COVID. So there have been some shifts in the healthcare landscape, but I nevertheless think there are some lessons to be taken out of the care models there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Colleen, I'm going to ask you, do we have time for more questions or time for me to, to pose a question? Okay. We, we certainly do. Okay, excellent. Um, lots of lots of thumbs up for community health workers. Um, and actually, maybe that would be a good pivot because this is one of the questions I had hoped to pose to you. Um, you know, in as I mentioned, you know, we heard repeatedly that these workforces, community health workers, navigators were absolutely critical and were some of the most, if not the only connections that patients had with the healthcare system. So this is, we, we often heard a version of this story from awardees that these folks, the, the, the community, the CHWs would work incredibly diligently to collect, to connect with patients. You know, CHWs were holding meetings in Dunkin' Donuts locations. We had a staff person whom we learned spent several hours in, an el in a closed elevator going up and down with a patient who was claustrophobic and needed to get over that in order to have a much needed MRI. We've heard of, of, of patient navigators who maintained contact with patients while they were incarcerated and immediately you know, sort of reconnected when, when, when the patient was released. So you know, this is an incredibly difficult and emotionally taxing work that isn't particularly well compensated. So understandably, people who do these jobs get burned out and they leave, which is both difficult for them and frankly, really difficult for patients who are already mistrustful of the system to have their, their, their one point of contact go. So the, the question I would love to pose to this group is, you know, if we all believe that, the, that these workforces are incredibly important, and I think based on the chat, we, we do, are there ways we can support them through policy? What, what advice would you give us? Hi, this is Lisa Gergoni from Mass Home Care. Um, I, I think that's a great question. And I think one of the ways that Mass Health has been trying to encourage um, the partnership with community-based organizations and community health workers is sort of like with their ACO model, where mm -hmm. they're, they have the community partners program model, which is component of the model, so that the ACOs need to partner with the community providers to have that you know, conversation or that connection. And I think it's been, we found very successful and hoping that that will continue in the next phase. But that's one area that the policy really does inform the process that the ACO established. Thank you, Lisa. Any other thoughts or suggestions that people would be inclined to share? Maybe a, a quick comment in that um, if, if there's any, um, one of the many benefits born out of the last year and a half with COVID-19, uh, as we talk about um, telemedicine and so many other areas, is this recognition of community health workers, uh, the critical role they play, the fact that they're trusted, they're on the ground, uh, and me representing community health centers, the critical role that they play, and Lizette and others uh, who work in this space. Um, Right now, the work to support them is real episodic. You know, there are, uh, you know, efforts on the state side to really resource the whole evolution of community health workers, the training and upskilling of that workforce. Um, and then there's some philanthropic dollars where people are trying to say, how do we resource community health workers? But there's no coordinated strategy in the state to really grow that workforce uh, in the way that we should. So we realize anything out of the last year and a half we need to prioritize them, navigators and others, as a, as a critical, critical tool to reach communities that are often uh, hard to reach and um, underserved. Thank you so much. I, I just want to note in the chat, uh, Catherine McLean noted in response to Lisa's comment that several of our awardees who did sustain their TC, TCCI programs did so by joining the Behavior Health Community Partners Program. So it, it definitely reflects this uh, MassHealth's strong effort in this area. 
Um, I also note some suggestions. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, uh, this is Liz Sedlon there from Machua. This question is uh, a fantastic question and I'm glad we're discussing it here. Uh, there are three reasons community health workers leave uh, the work that they love. And the main one, of course, is salaries. And the second one is invisibility. Even though uh, there is ample data about how important they are in addressing uh, non-medical health needs, there are no real or, or systematic ways in which they communicate with the rest of the team. There are no systematic ways in which they are integrated as full members of the primary care team. So I think that a policy area will be um, guiding uh, principles on integration and uh, also standardizing the role so that it's not up for the employer uh, to define what community of work is and it's not, but there are real guidelines. That's one point. And the second one, Michael, is thank you for the acknowledgement of Machua. And yes, there is potentially an entity that's trying to coordinate uh, the efforts, but state associations across the country are underfunded or not funded at all. So I think it's important to start thinking about creating the infrastructure within the state that will allow professional associations such as Machua to provide this coordinating role that is so needed. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's incredibly helpful feedback. And I just want to make, make a note in the, in the theme of learning. Um, you know, as I said, one of the most important things that comes out of these investment programs is what we can learn and what we can share, but also how it influences our own work. And we heard similar themes about sort of invisibility as it related to doula care. And in our beside investment program, we took some of the themes that we had heard and, and integrated that into our processes. So it's, it's, it's really helpful to hear this kind of general feedback. Um, let me see here. So we're hearing a lot of um, feedback here in terms of, of uh, licensure, salary, and compensation, um, invest, uh, outreach to community members, um, pipeline programs as well. Um, uh, looks like uh, also comments about um, I'm saying something from from Liz about I. Uh, deficits to prove value, but if we quantified patients who stop follow-up when they lose contact with their CHW uh, and the associated increased cost, that would be another way to, uh, and, and I hate to use this term as well, but to demonstrate the return on an investment in community health workers. Um, it looks like Ron Dunlap has a comment by all means. Yes, so the COVID-19 has pointed out the technologic uh, barriers that many in our population face. So 40 to 45% of seniors can't get online, 20 to 25% of minorities can't get online. And given that we've moved into telemedicine as something that's probably going to continue, that is a huge problem. So my comment is that I think that the HPC perhaps could put out there the concept that healthcare organizations should assess the technologic readiness of the patient populations they treat as a population health management um, tool, and that the community groups would be involved with helping to educate and, and let that, I mean, I know the senior citizens in our community helps to teach seniors how to use computers and so forth. So I think there's a, there's a dual role there, but I think the, the assessment that we have to make is huge because every outbreak, we're, we're behind the eight ball and that we're, we're implementing the measures in the communities, for instance, vaccination or testing where the COVID-19 impact was the lowest. And in the areas where it was the highest, we were very late to the game. So before the next pandemic or the next outbreak, we really have to have a strategy that, that goes to the communities that need it the most. So the fact that we're lagging behind and getting communities of color vaccinated, we knew that from the beginning. And mm -hmm. the, the strategies to, to uh, let them uh, go to their so-called source of truth was really developed late. And I think that's something we have to do. The other thing I think is that we have to really, for the first time, truly, we do a tremendous job at the policy commission analyzing hospital data, 
but we really have to start to analyze outpatient data, particularly the health clinics who are treating the underserved to see how we're doing, what can be improved and what the barriers are. Thank you, thank you very much. I think you have lots of support for that thinking in the chat, but let me turn to Colin Killick who has his hand up and has been waiting patiently. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think that you know, in, in, in this area and broader, uh, I think the magic word in a lot of this is magic words are avoid institutionalization, right? Like we've seen quite clearly that when people wind up getting stuck into institutional settings, their care costs more and their outcomes get worse. And in the case of COVID, a great many people have died as a direct result of being stuck in institutions. And home health workers and community health workers are critical in that they keep people out of institutions. And so do investments in things like social determinants of health, you know, like housing, like nutrition, like transportation. And so I think that the overriding message here is not to be penny wise and pound foolish, right? We don't need to, we need to make sure we avoid cuts to those kinds of services. And in fact, we invest in them more, not only because it will save money by keeping people out of institutions, but because it will dramatically improve quality of life. Thank you very much. I don't want to cut off this robust discussion uh, and, uh, right now, but I also want to see if possibly we could pivot to a related conversation which is about the role of robust community partnerships. As I mentioned during my remarks, you know, many of the organizations when in addressing patients with very complex social, personal or social situations, clinical situations, you know, really benefited from the expertise brought to bear by organizations that focus exclusively on housing or exclus exclusively on food, on food security. Um, I would be interested in hearing feedback on what the HPC's role could be or is, should be in encouraging and supporting the development of maximally effective uh, partnerships between healthcare and community, community organizations to address both health-related social needs and the underlying social determinants of health. Sorry, that's a pretty big ask. <laughs> Well, uh, Kelly, this is Kim Brooks from Hebrew Senior Life, and I know I've expressed this to you and to Catherine before. I think the HPC has a huge opportunity here to play a really big role. There are some pretty major infrastructure challenges that keep this from happening well, and I think to whatever degree HPC can play a role in convenings and just helping to facilitate these partnerships, we could really advance this work a lot faster than all these individual organizations trying to be really scrappy and get it done on their own. Thanks so much. Any other thoughts? I also I also want to note a comment from the prior question from Catherine McLean in the chat um, with regard to dealing with the digital divide. Um, and she does note that in one of our investment programs, which actually took place before COVID, an awardee uh, dispatched support staff to homebound uh, elders to uh, get them set up in telemedicine and enable them to engage with uh, services. This is Pat Keller at the Home Care Alliance. I, I agree with the, the previous call that HBC could play a really important role in, in sort of breaking through. I think in some ways we have a lot of the infrastructure. We have you know, hundreds of home health and home care agencies in the communities already but there are benefit design issues that, you know, um, get in the way of making these partnerships. You know, MassHealth doesn't cover social workers at home, community health workers aren't covered under the MassHealth benefit, how we could integrate either of those into our teams. Um, and I do think, as I said in the chat room, and I think Michael Curry said it elo eloquently before me, you know, really the ability to assess social determinants of health needs, you know, happens in the home, you know, seeing food insecurity, medication issues, transportation issues really can only occur when you actually see someone in their own environment. So, you know, I think HPC, I, as someone had said, you know, sort of looking at the infrastructure we already have and how we can adapt that to what we think is missing is, is where I think HPC could help. Thank you. Other thoughts? Good afternoon, can you hear me? I can. Hi, I'm Anna Paskowski. I represent Bay State Health in Western Mass. I'm in primary care. 
Um, we are the clearinghouse of healthcare in many ways in primary care. I would love to see more integration of folks who are connected with those um, established community resources. Um, unfortunately, we're really pressed for time. So making it very easy for frontline clinicians to connect people with those Many health centers do it better, but uh, you know, I we have about you know 15 practices that are not connected with that. There's a lar- large swath of the population that's not getting into some of those resources. Just like we have care management, I would love to have somebody working with community resources embedded in our practice, so we're not being scrappy and reinventing the wheel each time. Thank you for that. We we do love scrappy, but I would say probably embedded Trump scrappy every time. So with that, let me say um, a sincere thank you to all um, advisory council members for, for listening to this update and providing this helpful advice. And we will move on to our next agenda item. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kelly. Um, and on this slide, you can see some of the, the upcoming publications um, on this program. Um, so before we shift to talking about the, the cost trends report, um, I did want to take uh, some time here today to really open up the discussion about some of the current challenges your organizations are facing, uh, dealing with capacity issues, staffing issues, um, as we are at, at this uh, new stage, unique stage of, of the pandemic response. Um, As you know, the Health Policy Commission is charged by the legislature with studying uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the healthcare system and on its workforce. And that was a big topic of conversation at our last advisory council meeting. Uh, We also are continuously working to help support uh, the Executive Office of Health and Human Services and the Department of Public Health in monitoring and and helping to manage uh, hospital capacity in particular. Um, so did feel like it was uh, important for us to have a little bit of time here today to reflect on the, the current context um, as things have evolved. And so um, at this point, really going to open it up to hear from all of you and for you to share some of your reflections and perspectives uh, with us as we continue to study the impact of COVID on the healthcare system. Um, I'm going to start with... Um, uh, Chris Schuster, uh, who is the president and CEO at, at Emerson Hospital, um, and and you know I, I I know and it has been widely reported that hospitals are um, dealing with with capacity issues, uh, not only related to COVID nineteen patients, but actually you know a lot of, of non COVID patients um, that are are seeking care and um, exacerbated by behavioral health needs. Um, that's what we're seeing in the data, but. Chris, I would love to hear your um, boots on the ground perspective on on what, how is it going and and what challenges you're facing. Thanks, David. Um, And hello, everyone. Um, You're absolutely right. Um, I think many folks have delayed care uh, throughout COVID and we're definitely seeing um, an impact of not just COVID patients, but um, actually more of sicker patients who need care. And mental health Um, is a huge concern for us, both at the adult, but especially at the pediatric and adolescent level. Um, And there's an acute shortage of beds overall. But I mean, as of today, I have three adolescents in my emergency department that have been there for more than four days, uh, which, as you know, it's not the greatest place when you have mental health issues to be in a short stay acute um, environment. And so that is uh, a big challenge for for all the hospitals. The other thing is the labor shortage. So for multitude of reasons, people not wanting to work in COVID, people who have retired early because they didn't want to work in in an environment that had COVID, folks who got uh, funding from the federal government who decided um, I don't really need to take a job because I have this funding. There's uh, many, many reasons. But the labor shortage at all levels of clinical staffing has become a huge problem for hospitals. And it's actually compounded by, um, which I believe is the right thing you know, uh, to do, which is the vaccination mandate. So um, it, it's, hard in, 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 it's hard for staffing right now, it's going to get harder because many people will leave the, the workforce because of the vaccination mandate um, as well. Then we have the issue of 
um, no regulation on staffing agencies. So what happens in that case is that um, a nurse will be working for us for a certain dollar rate, will get two and a half times or three times that and could show up in your hospital as a traveler. Um, and, and she might've been an employee three weeks ago, uh, making um, a lot more side by side with your regular loyal, loyal staff. And then it also creates a rate war within the market that drives up total um, labor costs, which of course really is of interest to us here because that's gonna drive up our total medical expense. So there's things that are really beyond our control uh, relative to that. And, and as a result of that, I will say costs continue to go up in general because of the added things we have to have in place for COVID. Um, you know, everything from masks, people checking people in uh, to the hospitals, um, the systems that are required to check our staff every day for COVID symptoms. And finally, uh, believe it or not, a lack of tertiary care beds. So I'm in the community and I have patients who need to go um, into an academic or tertiary center. And before it was pretty easy transfer. And now we often have to make five or six calls. And in some cases um, we're sending patients to Connecticut um, who seems to uh, in, have trying to help us out. So, you know, I, I've outlined a number of things that I really do think is going to impact our ability to do what we want to do, which is really care for, for patients in the community. Thank you, Chris, and, and, and thank you for everything that you and, and your people are doing. Um, I think the, the staffing challenges, uh, the labor challenges, I think is a theme that extends even um, beyond the hospitals. And, and Lisa, I know you, you had um, maybe some comments as well. Yeah, and, and Christine, it was really your comments were very helpful to me. I, it's, I work in home health and we have the same challenges. Um, but I think on the other spectrum with the direct care workers, um, we you know, work with elder affairs. And as of uh, August, we've been surveying the, the network to see how many individuals, older adults are actually waiting to be matched with a home care worker. And in August, it was over 5,000 consumers statewide. So that means people who have been assessed to say they need home care workers and we can't find them a worker. And it's all the same challenges you have. Um, you know, we, we have the same issue also with the private pay market. You know, we're seeing a lot of these workers who used to work with the the state funded services, uh, because there are mandates for COVID um, vaccines, which we 100% support, but they're going to the private side and working under the table um, where families may or may not care if they're vaccinated. So it's just, and I know it's across the board everywhere, but it's, it's really you know impacting our ability to serve some of the most vulnerable individuals um, in Massachusetts right now. It's, it's pretty scary. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Um, and and you know I've been reflecting on some of these these staffing challenges and, and and the labor challenges and you know struggling to kind of think of what are what are the policy levers that we can pull both kind of in the short term here but also to um, set us up you know in the future um, to be able to have the workforce that we need for the healthcare system that our our, our patients need and so um, you know I think there's probably both both short term and long term policy implications to this conversation and you know, uh, would love your reflections, you know, now, later, um, throughout, um, as we think about how we can um, address both of those. So, Deb, um, President and CEO at, at Lawrence General, uh, please um, share, share some thoughts with us. So, I would echo um, everything that um, Christine and Lisa are saying. Um, definitely, that is what's happening on the ground. I think you all know Lawrence was in the, you know, the middle of this in terms of per capita COVID incidence rate. And really um, it was a dramatic impact to the organization. Right now, uh, as of yesterday, we just went over 20 uh, positive or presumed positive COVID patients. So that, you know, does bring a set of challenges. We're dealing with the very same workforce issues that Christine mentioned. Um, from a throughput standpoint, we have patients that are upstairs that we can't um, discharge to post-acute facilities. We can't find behavioral health placement. Uh, we've had, um, we're on day 21 of code help. And we have, you know, 20 to 28, 30 holds that we're trying to push through a very busy emergency center. So, you know, I mean, I don't want to be an alarmist, but these workforce issues, the price gouging, not being able to find post-acute or tertiary beds, 
It's, and now our COVID number is going up over 20 and half of them are fully vaccinated. So this, all of this is, you know, converging when a workforce that we have are very, very tired. Uh, we're mandating the vaccine as Christine mentioned, and uh, we're at about 90% overall, but you know, uh, even if we make tremendous headway, we're gonna lose some of our workforce at a time when it's, um, you know, there's a need for all hands on deck. So it's, it's a very, very serious situation and anything that you can do from a policy standpoint to get access to us, to uh, workforce needs. It's not just nurses, it's transport. It's, it's, you know, across the board vacancies that are making it very challenging. Thank you, Deb. Um, and, and Steve, you, you sit and, and talk to hospitals uh, across the Commonwealth. Um, what, are, what, are, what are you hearing? Thanks, David. Um, and you know, I always feel so, so good at these advisory council meetings. We talk about important issues. I, I do appreciate the backdrop that you suggested today. It's, it's really bad. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we can't get relief is because it's bad all across the country. We are seeing capacity challenges them more than they were in the height of COVID. And I guess at the macro level, because I really don't want to bifurcate what we talk about here with what we're going to talk about in a few minutes. I guess I appreciate that, that, that you opened the meeting with the question about COVID today, but it appears fundamentally flawed to me that there was no discussion about COVID at the commissioner meeting. So we have these great meetings with the advisory council. Your team does such an incredible job. And then it seems to stop when it gets to the level of the commissioner. The only time COVID was brought up in the discussion about the recommendations was by you uh, with some very important comments and then some very important comments by Secretary Sutters. Um, and the only other time it was mentioned is when a commissioner suggested that providers would be pushing harder for price increases to make up for delayed care and loss of dollars due to COVID. And when you go to these emergency rooms right now and you see people that are waiting 12 plus hours, um, they're, Concern isn't about whether they're gonna make up the cost of that care. There were 643 people boarding in our emergency departments last week. And David Mattiotto and Donna Mush and others can jump in. They didn't have a place to go. So I, I get that people fully wanna go back to some semblance of normal, but our healthcare organizations don't have that option. They're still very much feeling this ongoing impact of the pandemic. There's an intense new set of issues, staffing shortages, capacity challenges, behavioral health boarding crisis, and an influx of really sick patients that need intensive care due to deferred treatment. Now, the HPC, you've, you've been a leader in this. The leadership by you and your staff has helped keep the entire system running for the last 20 months, and it has ultimately saved lives. And you've been a big part of the response right now. And so thank you. And I just hope that the commissioners, David, follow your lead the lead of Secretary Sutters and the lead of your team and dive in on what's occurring right now in their communities. The system will never look like it did in 2018 ever again. And that's the data we're gonna discuss in a few moments. It's inextricably changed based on the last 20 months. The priority should be on ending this public health emergency, completing the COVID-19 report, answering the challenges of the workforce and looking for solutions that move us forward based on where the system is today, not where it used to be. I'm sorry if I'm passionate about this, but every day I'm hearing from providers that just can't find beds uh, for their patients. And it's becoming, uh, as Deb said, alarming. Thank you, Steve. I, I share your passion on, on all of these topics as, as well. Um, you mentioned behavioral health and, and David Mattiotto, you have your hand raised. I'd love to- uh, Sure, sure. sure. Th thank you, David and, um, and Steve, thanks for mentioning that and everybody else as well about behavioral health. And yes, I mean, not to all, all of the above and said before is, is, is very accurate. And the inpatient behavioral health system is really besieged now. Um, we have in met, just to give people a quick rundown, we have 20, 2,875 licensed beds and we have about we're running a census on an average day of about 2,250. So we have over 600 unoccupied beds, most of which is due, of course, to workforce and acuity. Acuity is very important, and we feel awful for the emergency rooms that have over 600 people waiting on a given day for a bed. They, we feel we really would like 
and when really feel compelled to meet that demand, but it's just not possible because of the staffing issues. But one thing I would note as well, unfortunately, the community system has felt this as well. And we have lost, for example, in Massachusetts, over 50 psychiatric day programs where people would go and, you know, get get checked out and so forth. We've lost over 50 in the last four years. So those folks, unfortunately, are probably going to the emergency room. So we have this whole uh, situation of real incredible demand. Governor Baker in Mass Health and EOHS have stepped up very, very admirably, actually. And we have some money coming for workforce, but we're going to need a lot more. Um, we're trying to meet the demand. We're adding new beds. Ironically, we're adding 300 new beds by the end of this calendar year. I keep asking, where are we going to get the people? So we're pushing with the legislature. We're pushing everywhere, working very closely with Mass Hospital Association, doing all we can to, to address this. But it's it's pretty bad right now. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, JD, are you with us? Hi. <laughs> How are you? Um, just just to pick up quickly on this this talent question, um, I spent the summer talking to, to members of the roundtable, and this talent crunch thing came up in every industry, um, every size company, every region of the of the state. And um, one, in fact, one of our members referred to it as a, we are in a take this job and shove it economy where the employee really is holding the cards right now. Um, and so you asked David, what do we do about it from a policy perspective? And I think, you know, it's a, it's a pretty complex question. Here at the round table, we've been thinking about it basically in three buckets, right? What do you, what, what do you do to attract and retain people to a place? And I start to think about things like childcare, which allows people to work, right? Um, infrastructure, housing, Right, these, these issues that um, are preventing people from working, how do we invest in those? There's a second bucket around talent development, which I, we've heard a little bit about today, the sort of the pipeline stuff I saw somebody put in the chat, but how do you align education workforce programs with needs of employers? And we're doing some, some kind of specific work in that space as well. And there's some, um, there are some, some legislative um, proposals around that. And then there's a third bucket around um, talent diversity and making sure that the, the pipelines are diverse, that we're attracting um, a diverse pool of talent as well. So we're starting to create a framework to answer your question, David, which is what do we do policy-wise to address this talent, talent crunch? And I'm happy to, um, to work with you on that as we, as we advance that work here at the round table. Uh, that would be great, JD. And I, I think you, you are raising the, the observation that this really is, um, some of these are, are not unique to the healthcare system. Um, obviously, our healthcare system is, is overtaxed right now, um, uh, but that there are some of these strategies really could apply kind of across our economy um, and, and across the Commonwealth. Um, so that, that would be really great to continue to connect on that. Um, I, I would note just, just very briefly on, on thinking of kind of policy solutions and um, in specifically in the healthcare space here. You know, we released a report earlier this year that called for the Commonwealth to join uh, an interstate nurse uh, uh, licensure compact, uh, which would allow for uh, greater flexibility for out-of-state nurses to come and be able to practice here. Um, this has been uh, basically accommodated through other means during the pandemic, but joining that compact is one way uh, we think that we can um, be able to attract uh, nursing. Obviously, as Steve said, this is a this is a national crunch right now. Um, we have also advocated in the past for uh, revisions to scope of practice laws that can allow different uh, healthcare professionals and workers to practice uh, effectively and efficiently at the top of their license. And, and some of those have been passed into legislation uh, earlier this year. So, you know, I think it really is kind of a whole pipeline. How do we attract people? How do we um, educate, attract, retain, and then have um, put people in the place to be as effective as possible in, in their roles? Um, Megan? Hi, thanks, David. Um, uh, Megan from Mass Nurses. Um, I think that, you know, obviously we're not, we're the, we're the voice here that's not in favor of nurse licensure compact. And I think to Steve's point, we don't have a magical pool of nurses out there that are kind of coming to save the day. Um, and I think that they're really also, in addition to recruitment, 
we really need to be focused on retaining the talent that we have right now. Um, nurses are burning out. And I know um, it's probably true all over the healthcare sector. And if we don't keep them at the bedside, we may lose them forever. Um, and I think especially with new graduates, it's not just them that we're seeing that with. We're seeing nurses who are you know, 20, 25 years into their career who are drowning right now and have been drowning for the last year and a half. And if we don't put an effort, you know, recruitment is really important, but if we don't look at retention, like what are they, like what do we need to do to keep them at the bedside? We're just gonna be in this perpetual cycle. Um, and we are, as Steve said, we're not the only state. I mean, states out there that have nurse licensure compact are begging nurses to come to their state. It's a problem across the board in the middle of a almost two year pandemic. Um, so I would just caution, there's not like a magic bullet to solve this and we need to be looking at all kind of aspects. Thanks. Thank you, Megan. And, and absolutely no, no, no silver bullet, magic bullet here. Um, and will require, I think, uh, you know, a set of a set of strategies. Um, um, Dr. Strongwater. Yeah, a great conversation. And uh, I really appreciate you highlighting the topic. It's hard for me not to say, invest and strengthen primary care ambulatory practices to keep people out of hospitals, and to use uh, programs like ED at home for avoidable hospitalizations and to decompress emergency rooms by treating them in their homes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Strongwater. Any other comments or reflections people want to add to this conversation um, before moving on? Okay. Well, uh, much more to come on this. R really appreciate that conversation and, and, and your comments. And um, I suspect at, this will be a topic of conversation at, at future advisory council meetings um, uh, far into the future. So thank you all. And thank you for all the work that you and your organizations do. Um, so I'm gonna uh, shift now and uh, bring back up the slides to uh, begin a conversation with all of you as I outlined at the beginning about kind of the next stage of, of where we go with, with healthcare cost containment and, and uh, reform in Massachusetts. And want to share and reflect on our latest cost friends report, which was released uh, just two weeks ago, um, that really looks at some of the key drivers of, of healthcare spending, cost, utilization, pricing. You can see on this slide, just an outline of some of the topics that are covered both in the report and in the um, chart pack. Um, but, you know, I want to spend more of our time here today um, just kind of reflecting on the affordability challenge, um, because in addition to all of the challenges that we just talked about for 45 minutes, there continues to be an affordability challenge of, of health care in Massachusetts. Uh, there was a, recently a, a survey that was conducted, and I think the results just came out uh, this earlier this week or late last week that said that 74% of Massachusetts residents are, are worried or very worried about their ability to afford healthcare in the future. Um, and that more than half had had a hardship related to healthcare affordability. And, and we, we see that too in, in the data. Um, if we just wanna advance the slide here, um, you know, in this report, we're, we're reflecting on some trends um, prior to the pandemic, but as you can see, uh, this just shows that the Commonwealth did exceed our state benchmark, our goal that we set in Chapter 224 uh, for the uh, two prior years, 3.6%, and then accelerating to 4.3%. Um, and the next slide um, shows that uh, pricing, uh, healthcare prices, which continue to be a driver of that overall spending growth, um, this has been a long-term trend. Um, and on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, this is actually data, national data that shows uh, hospital price increases all the way through up um, until the end of 2020, beginning of 2021. So this is actually uh, much more recent data than some of the state data that we have. And as a result of this, on the next slide, uh, we see that the cost of healthcare is, is very high. Uh, it, the Massachusetts health insurance premiums have tripled in 19 years, consuming an ever larger portion of earnings for middle-class families. 
Um, here we're comparing health insurance premiums to the cost of a new compact car. Um, and of course, it's, it's families and employers uh, that bear the rising costs of, of our healthcare system and the rising premiums. And we see that that has real impacts on abil people's ability to access the healthcare system. Um, and, and we have seen, I think on the next slide, um, that there are many adults in Massachusetts who go without needed care or prescription drugs because of the cost of that care. Um, and it, you know, there are variations within that. Certainly lower income individuals have a higher likelihood of foregoing needed care. Uh, also um, communities of color have a higher likelihood of forge foregoing needed care because of the cost of that care. And in this particular survey that we analyzed here in the report, uh, we were able to um, be able to see that on the next slide that for those individuals who did uh, defer care, um, they were much more likely, twice as likely to report having a potentially avoidable ED visit. So there is a, a clear connection here between affordability challenges that people have, how they're accessing the healthcare system and leading to perhaps unnecessary institutional care, unnecessary hospitalization care, which we've mentioned a few times already as a shared goal of all of us to be able to meet patients' needs in their communities and in their homes and when they need them through a strong primary care system. So reflecting on all of these trends on the next slide, um, we really focused our recommendations this year on the intersecting challenges of cost containment, affordability, and equity, and see that these are really interrelated concepts and that um, uh, it's necessary for us to continuously keep our urgent, urgency on cost containment efforts, or, or else we're not going to be able to make real gains in the affordability of care uh, and the equity of care. And that these three things need to be intentionally targeted through our policies. And in so doing, hopefully create a virtuous cycle, uh, a virtuous cycle where we make gains on cost containment that, um, that increase affordability and reduce unnecessary inequities. So this is really the framing uh, for this year's report. Um, and for the recommendations uh, included therein, uh, which start on the next slide. Um, so this year, we really uh, focused on uh, kind of a focused set of recommendations um, and uh, really consolidated them into the areas of focus that we are calling on uh, the legislature uh, and the administration and our collective community um, to work together to help advance. Um, I would note that uh, at the meeting where we advanced these recommendations, Secretary Sutters did indicate that the governor is, and her are, are working on uh, potential health care legislation uh, to be filed uh, perhaps later this year. Um, and so there is already a, you know, momentum from the administration uh, that there should be uh, perhaps an opportunity to advance legislation this session. And so through these recommendations, we sought to put out um, a blueprint that, to help guide the legislature and the administration think of a particular areas of priority uh, for, for action. So I will uh, try to summarize these very quickly and then uh, I will stop talking and would love uh, your feedback on, on how we can work together to advance some of these. Um, so first, uh, we had a recommendation around strengthening the accountability measures that are included within Chapter 224, uh, specifically around uh, the performance improvement plan process. Um, as other states have advanced ideas of a healthcare cost growth benchmark or target, uh, other states have um, included greater accountability mechanisms, and we think that there are areas for improvement here. Uh, the second area of focus, which begins on the next slide, uh, is really around the role of price growth as a primary driver of healthcare spending growth. Um, and here you can see a number of sub recommendations uh, targeted at different aspects of excessive prices um, that, that can be addressed um, through policy. On the third recommendation, we really focus on the role of health plans um, and the uh, 
requiring greater accountability of health plans to deliver value for their employers and consumers uh, and recommend new affordability standards and an improved rate plan approval process that will require greater transparency and public participation in the premium review process, uh, as well as other ways that health plans can work with their employers or work with their providers to reduce administrative complexity and improve benefit design. The fourth recommendation is focused on advancing health equity for all. Um, and here you can really see the interconnectedness between cost containment, affordability, and equity. And here we see that there's a great opportunity for the collective um, community to come together and set measurable goals and targets for advancing health equity so that we can measure and hold ourselves accountable to improvements. Um, as I think we talked about at length earlier um, in that great conversation um, on TCCI, uh, we see the, the great potential for addressing social determinants of health to improve the health of our, our patients and populations, and of course need data uh, to help uh, design and guide and refine all of those efforts. And then finally, uh, we have a recommendation that is uh, kind of a little bit of a catch-all, uh, but uh, is certainly uh, these are our recommendations we have made in the past and still feel that they are critically important. Um, so areas around uh, understanding differences and changes in, in medical coding. Uh, we certainly want to continue to push on reducing drug spending and aligning drug spending and pricing with value. Uh, we continue to recommend that we should improve our primary care and behavioral health care systems uh, through investments. Um, again, I think a very um, thematically linked to the conversation that we were just having um, as well as efforts to um, reduce unnecessary care. So uh, let's go back to the first slide that has kind of the areas of focus um, uh, laid out here. And I will, um, I'm gonna stop talking now and, and we'll open it up for your reflections on these recommendations. Um, and again, how, how we can work together to advance some of these. So I'm gonna start with uh, my colleague from the Group Insurance Commission, uh, Matt Vina. Thanks, David. And let me start by just thanking you and the rest of the HPC team for putting out a really fantastic report and um, a really robust set of recommendations for what I think um, constitute kind of a next iteration of the cost containment framework that we've set up here for Massachusetts and positions us to continue to be a leader um, among states across the country. Um, and, you know, reflecting on um, Steve Walsh's comments and others from the provider community, I think we need to be, certainly need to be very um, aware of the environment in which these recommendations are being made. Um, it is a unique and historically challenging moment uh, for us in Massachusetts, but certainly for the rest of the country and for the healthcare system. Um, and I think we need to spend time sorting through as we have and will continue to do um, how COVID is changing the landscape, both the healthcare system and impacting healthcare consumers in, um, in many ways. Um, but I think it's really critical to also not lose focus on this longer term discussion. And that's the way I think about this. So at the, at the GIC, as you and others surely know, we are beginning the process of developing our strategy for our next health benefit procurement, um, which will um, shape the benefits we offer to our 426,000 members across the Commonwealth. Um, starting in fiscal year 24 and for the next five years. Um, so God willing, we will be on the other side of COVID by that time, but right now is when we're developing those strategies. And I have to imagine that both the governor and the crafting of his bill and the legislature and their respective bills, they are also looking to the horizon um, and beyond for steps that we need to take here. So. I, I, I appreciate all of the discussion that we've had both about COVID and the discussion about this to come, but 
Um, I think we can do both and we really need to do both um, so that we can balance those two competing challenges. Um, so I, I, the recommendations you've put forward here are I think to no one's surprise here very much over, over, overlay a lot of the challenges that we face and really need to tackle to provide affordability to our members and to ultimately to the taxpayers that fund most of the benefits to our members. Um, so um, I've read it with a great deal of interest and we're already incorporating it into our work and our thinking. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. And I, I appreciate your, your, your framing there. And I agree with it. I think we, we, we can have um, uh, multiple conversations at the same time. And I do think need to. And as I reflect on, you know, chapter 224, it really was a long-term strategy. I mean, this was, this is a, this was a long-term strategy for cost containment. And now at our 10 year anniversary, an opportunity to learn lessons that will we can implement over the next 10 years and to be able to set the Commonwealth uh, to continue to be a leader, a national leader in this space. Uh, Alyssa, I'm going to turn it over to you. Hi, thank you, David. Uh, Alyssa Vangeli from Healthcare for All, and I'm sitting in for Amy Rosenthal today. So I just want to start by thanking you, David, and the HPC staff um, for the focus on affordability in the report this year, as well as in the policy recommendations. I think, you know, year after year, as you said, we are seeing increases in consumer cost growth, both in the form of premiums and cost sharing, as you said. We've seen the Chia data, we've seen the data from the um, MI, MHIS survey. Um, and, you know, there needs to be more done. The status quo is not working for consumers. And so we really appreciate the focus here. Um, so a, a couple of comments, and I want to be um, cognizant of, of, of time here, but um, I appreciate you also raising the survey that was released earlier this week. And I want to just emphasize a couple points um, regarding what this survey has showed about health equity and the intersection with affordability in the state. So not only did the survey show significant affordability challenges, but those challenges were higher for survey respondents who identified as people of color, specifically Black or African American and Latinx or Hispanic. So um, the number was 51% of residents uh, expressing affordability burdens. That number was up to 75% for people identifying as Black or African American and 68% for those identifying as Latino and Hispanic. Um, there were specific findings around prescription drug affordability challenges where about one in four Massachusetts residents reported not filling a prescription or rationing medication cutting doses because of um, prescription drug cost concerns. And those numbers were also higher for those identified as people of color. The numbers were 36% of those identified as African-American and 33% for those identifying as Hispanic or Latinx. And I think the MI, um, MHIS survey also showed some um, racial disparities in terms of people's ability to um, afford afford care. So as we're talking about these affordability challenges, I think it's really important to keep the equity lens in mind as well. And as we're talking about the intersection with COVID, we know that COVID has exacerbated and laid bare the <clears throat> inequities that have been apparent in our healthcare system for a long time now. So I think that that does put some additional urgency on making sure that we're addressing these consumer affordability issues. Um, healthcare for all and all the legislative proposals that we're supporting this session, we have intentionally incorporated a health equity component. And I will say that a number of our policy proposals um, reflect some of the changes that have been uh, made through the HPC policy recommendations. And some of these changes need legislative action. Some of them can be made through regulatory changes. Um, but I do think now, you know, is a time to think about what the burden is on, on consumers and families, both during the COVID pandemic and as we're coming out of the pandemic and what we can certainly do both in the short term and, and long term. And so I just wanna applaud um, the HPC. I think, you know, we, again, can talk in further detail, but certainly have, you know, there are components of one and two that, that we think are critical, recognizing that underlying cost growth is a huge component of, of the consumer costs that people are experiencing and many components of number three and four are also really critical, especially, um, and then a number five, the, um, the pharma cost containment recommendation as well. So I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alyssa, for, for highlighting some of the findings from that survey. And if you can uh, share a link with that, uh, that would be great. Absolutely. Um, uh, just to keep us moving here, Laura Pellegrini, I think you had raised your hand next. Uh, 
好玩啊。I think she dropped off for a minute, David. Oh, oh Lori, you call upon me. Okay, thank you.、Um, I know you're just dealing with the first、um, aspect of your focus here, but、um, I'll tell you, we've been taking our board through a lot of the recommendations of the Health Policy Commission, and there are many that we support.、Um, we believe that it is imperative that we make healthcare affordable, and while we deal do deal with this COVID、um, crisis, and we need to be very cognizant of that, and the hospitals laid out some of their challenges.、Um, We are still going to be, you know,、um, sending out bills to employers and to consumers, and the premium costs are going to be reflected in the underlying cost of care. So I think, as you reflect on your 10-year anniversary, it is going to be imperative that we learn、um, from the past years and that we work to strengthen some of、um, the authority of the Health Policy Commission around the cost benchmark. And so I think we can be very supportive of working with you. On that, you identify a number of other areas、um, here that you're going to probably go through.、I'll, for sake of time, I'll just grab it now.、Um, and the first is,、um, you know, anything we can do around surprise billing and some of those things in the short term,、um, we'd really like to see. You talk about an affordability standard that must be coupled with addressing underlying healthcare costs. There's no way we can. Add an affordability standard in our state unless we've tackled the underlying cost of healthcare and addressed that. We've recently gone through many of the HPC recommendations and recommendations of the Attorney General and others, and very few things have actually become law. Very few of the recommendations of the Health Policy Commission, the Attorney General, and others have become law. So I think we need to get serious about that. I think that maybe the Governor's bill、um, may address some of those things, and certainly the HPC, I believe, has authority to also file legislation. So if we're going to look at an affordability standard, which I think we're very willing to talk to you about,、um, it has to be coupled with serious efforts around cost containment,、uh, relative any, to any public process regarding health plan rates. I think we actually have that in the annual、um, cost trends hearing, where you can talk to certainly our members under oath about what are the drivers of healthcare cost. And so, if there is going to be a public process, we would want to work with you on that. We want to be sure that that's not overly politicized. And that it is an effort to really understand underlying healthcare costs and to ensure that premiums、um, are sufficient to come for the underlying cost, and that there isn't a political agenda to just suppress rates、um, and to leave the plans in a vulnerable position. So, I think we're very supportive of many of your recommendations again, and we really want to partner with you on seeing these through. So, thank you. Thank you, Laura, and and I, you made a point that I I, I want to stress too that we do think of these as as a holistic approach and that the recommendations are really intended to work together. Um, Deb, um, I see that you have your hand raised. Yes, David. Thanks. I just wanted to mention that you know there are providers like Lawrence General that have been、um, a solution to low cost, and、uh, yet we're caught up in、uh, tremendous market competitiveness and growth and mergers all around us. Uh, and if we're subjected to、uh, caps on rate increases and and caught up in all of that, we remain at a level that's unsustainable. And you know, I just wanted to make one comment about health equity. You know, I think、um, the comment was that COVID laid bare the true inequities. And I would start with making sure that the safety net providers like Lawrence General are actually able to continue to exist and provide maternity. Pediatric special care nursery to a community of color, and so while we try to manage、um, cost growth, which I totally understand it from a consumer perspective and an employer perspective, if we are going to advance health equity, we must make sure that safety net providers are viable and able to reinvest and have some margin,、um, because I know for Lawrence General, with everything that happened to us. We came really close to looking at key services that would have been really、um, unfortunate for the community. So there's a way to balance all of this, and everyone's points are very important. But safety net providers are are the entities that need to be pay it play a key role in health equity. So thank you. Thank you, Deb. And、um, in the the second recommendation around provider pricing, we explicitly. Uh, talk about、um, reducing price variation as a way to be able to、uh, redirect resources to those organizations that are truly treating、um, the most vulnerable, most complex patient population. So、um, that is a, a thought that is is reflected in in how we wrote that up. Perfect.、Um, Thank you. Yes,、um, Colleen, who is next here? 
We have Kim Brooks next with Dr. Dunlap on deck. Hi, thank you. Thanks for all this great work and the thoughtful policy recommendations. I think if I had an opportunity to edit, I'd suggest that, um, you know, in the section, in number four, there's a social determinants of health section kind of tucked in there. It's about addressing those needs. And I think, you know, consistent with the conversation we had with Kelly earlier, we'd pull that out of there and, and put it in number five with some really targeted strategies uh, and make it more about really activating and empowering all the community-based organizations that are already doing a lot of that work and that have captive audiences and the ability to really make an impact on health outcomes and you know existing relationships with a lot of um, uh, people out in the community. So I just think there's an opportunity to do a lot more there around the infrastructure and some of those components and and not make it specifically you know only about addressing the actual social determinants of health. So, thanks. Great, thank, thank you, Kim. Um, Dr. Dunlap? So, I, thanks, David. So as an, on, on, an add on to the set, uh, you know, safety net uh, comment, I think that uh, the question, my question would be, is it reasonable to establish a benchmark for the care of underserved patients such that all of the major hospital systems provide care at a certain level so that they're playing a role in contributing to the welfare of the community and, and to a certain extent, uh, taking some of the burden away from the safety net hospital so they're more fiscally uh, viable. So that just would be a, an interesting thought because they, they're benefiting from the private pay and, and have pretty nice margins, but the idea that perhaps they're not participating at the other end is not there. Thank you, Dr. Dunlap. And that's certainly uh, an area that we have monitored and looked at before. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left, so I'm going to try to give uh, the people who would raise their hands the, the last word here. So uh, John and then Bonnie, and then we'll, we'll, we'll be able to, to let everyone go. So John? Yeah, just quickly, David, thank you. Uh, when we're talking about affordability and equity, I see at the intersection of those two important issues, David, small businesses and their employees. And I just hope that, uh, that you, David, focus on that and realize that you know, small businesses, uh, increasingly the owners of small businesses are people of color um, and, and they're employing people of color. And, and no one is having a bigger affordability challenge today than small businesses. And it's not enough to give a bureaucratic answer. Let's send your employees to the connector because your big business competitors do not do that you're in, in these times, you've got to be competitive and have a package, affordable package for your employees. And, and uh, you know, I don't, it, it hasn't really gotten any attention, but the Biden administration really backstabbed uh, small businesses in Massachusetts by getting rid of our state rating factors, which go back to the Romney care, which was what was meant to uh, alleviate some of our problems of merging together non-group and small group into the merged marketplace. And that is a huge issue that's going to be very result in very large double digit premium increases for small businesses and their employees uh, come 2022. And this is all government created, David. Uh, you know, you can, we need to look at providers. We need to look at, at, at a lot of things, but we need to look in the mirror as well, David. I hope you guys are willing to do that and look at problems in the marketplace that government has created through bad and discriminatory policies in the market. Thank you, John. I, I will not give you a bureaucratic answer because I, I, I won't give you an answer at all right now, but I um, <laughs> certainly appreciate those, those comments. Um, all right, in our last minute, Bonnie, um, what, what are your thank thoughts? You. Yeah, so thank you, thank you, David. And I, I will be very brief and I, I just, one, I agree with everything that's already been said, so I won't be redundant by repeating any of the points. As you know, GBIO has been uh, you know, behind all, uh, all of these issues, all of these years. And uh, I do wanna say that I do think that the legislature, as, as proud as we have been of the benchmark, I think that the legislature has used our falling below the benchmark as an excuse to avoid addressing so many of the problems that we are seeing coming to a head, uh, you know, that have been brought to a head because of COVID. And so I really think that we are in a unique time to push back and to 
not allow hiding behind the benchmark as an excuse to avoid addressing these issues. And I really hope that so many of the organizations that are here today can um, work in coalition to put pressure on to make some of the changes that do need to be made legislatively uh, as well as regulatorily, but primarily legislatively that I think have been avoided by, by the legislature just kind of nibbling at the edges. So I think that we need to take this kind of conversation back to our organizations to look for ways, such as with small businesses, to work more, much more aggressively together to bring about these changes. Thank you, Bonnie. And uh, with that, thank, thank you all for just a really uh, incredible discussion and conversation over the last hour and a half. We really were able to dive deep on a number of, of really critical challenges uh, facing this Commonwealth now uh, and into the future. And I just always am so grateful for the coalition that exists here in Massachusetts and our ability to have uh, conversations to uh, disagree uh, without being disagreeable and to wrestle with these challenges together. So uh, we will continue to support that. We will continue to do our research and data uh, to help identify solutions and opportunities and to advance those together. So with that, um, thank you. Look forward to the Cost Friends hearings in November, and we will be meeting again before the end of the year uh, in December for our, our final advisory council uh, meeting. So thank you all.